Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, the modern cult classic Terrifier. And the potential and problems of adapting its leading man, Art the Clown, into Dead by Daylight. The first time I heard of the Terrifier films was in October 2022. When headlines started to make waves about a new movie that was so horrifying, people were throwing up in screenings. I saw these even in UK papers, where the film hadn't actually been released. And in a classic display of the Streisand effect in action, these salacious and frequently overblown rumours acted as marketing material for those interested in the truth of this film, to see if it was really as bad as they were saying. Naturally, my interest was piqued. International media attention condemning this excessive violence and gore of Terrifier 2 proved to be exactly what the film needed to enjoy success and renown and push the film's silent leading man, the sadistic butcher Art the Clown, into the public sphere of attention. Of course, as with any horror property, wait, scratch that, any property that gains even the slightest amount of recognisability, there is a small but dedicated group of fans who would give life and limb to see a Terrifier licensed chapter to bring art to Dead by Daylight. A group which this time includes people who've actually worked on the film. Steve Barton, an executive producer for Terrifier 2, has been very vocal about his support for art in Dead by Daylight, and Damien Leone, the franchise godfather and creator of Art the Clown, has expressed his love of the idea too, but could it ever actually happen? That's what this video is going to spend some time picking apart. Today we'll be talking about what Terrifier has to offer as part of a potential licensed collaboration with Dead by Daylight, the problems and risks that come with a Terrifier chapter, and ending as we normally do with a power concept for Art the Clown. But before we continue, a quick message from today's sponsor, Factor 75. The Terrifier movies have a reputation for being able to spoil your dinner, with their scenes of graphic violence. But I don't think anything could spoil Factor 75's delicious range of affordable meals delivered straight to your door and ready to go. They offer a wide variety of meal plans, including keto, vegetarian, high protein and low calorie options approved by dietitians and arriving ready to heat and eat right at your doorstep. Well, I mean, not literally eat at the doorstep, that would be a bit weird, but like, you could if you wanted to, I suppose? Eh, you get what I mean. Setting aside time, energy and resources to actually cook can be stressful and time consuming. But Factor 75 helps you cut that problem out of your life altogether and I'm here to help you help them help you to do that. Just take a look at the link in the description to check out Factor 75 for yourself and using the code on screen now and in the description lets them know I sent you so don't forget it, I'm watching you. Thanks once again to Factor 75 for sponsoring this video, and on that note, let's strap in and get knuckle deep into Terrifier. The silent slasher Art the Clown has a really interesting history on the big screen as a result of the underground low budget filmmaking that birthed him. His first appearance was not actually in the first Terrifier film, but instead in a short directed and written by Damien Leone called The Ninth Circle where he was kind of a background character as part of a melange of horror tropes and images that Leone was experimenting with. In his own words, Leone shoved all sorts of genre images into the ninth circle, like clowns, witches, demons and whatever else really, just to kind of see what stuck. But it's clear that the image Leone held of the black and white clown, played at this time by Mike Ginelli, was something Leone treasured and had a clearer vision of than the rest of the film. A lot of the traits that come to associate with art could be seen as early as this incarnation of the character. His trash bag full of implements, his clown horn, his love of syringes, all first made their appearances in this short, as well as the habit that would become characteristic of art over the years. Getting right up in his victims' faces and just kind of being annoying. Art is an unparalleled master at making people uncomfortable. Getting up close and personal and using his silent might act and total lack of restraint and tact to unsettle people by just fucking with them. There's a kind of sadism to it that's so petty it loops back around to being funny. Seeing perfectly ordinary people react awkwardly to art's antics is a lot of fun and is laden down with dramatic irony as we know what's going to happen to them is going to be anything but ordinary and way more serious than whatever it is he's currently doing. Michael Myers might stalk you, Freddy might appear in your dreams to mock you, but only art will rock up in your place of work with his trash bag full of torture instruments and basically dare anyone to stop him as he mildly irritates you for a little bit simply because he can. It's a level of audacity that makes art a lot of fun to watch on screen and there's a good reason that all his appearances throughout Leone's work fit in with this formula. 
The Ninth Circle cemented this behaviour as an art staple, and it endures to this day. As the only part of the Ninth Circle that had really any personality at all, Leon decided to explore the character of art further as he kept Mike Ginelli on to play the character in two further projects. 2011 short film Terrifier, which saw art attacking a random person at a gas station, and the 2013 feature film All Hallows Eve, which was an anthology story using footage from both the Ninth Circle and Terrifier to construct a bigger story with art existing as a fictional character in those shorts, slowly bleeding through into the real world. While All Hallows Eve and the art shorts that comprised it have received some reappraisal since Art's newfound cult's death in the Terrifier features, Damien Leon has kind of disavowed this project, and I understand why, because by all accounts it's pretty bland. Art really is the only watchable part of this one, and the Ginelli iteration of Art is rather more mean-spirited, misogynistic, and angry than the later version. As a result of this more serious take on Art, All Hallows Eve lacks much of the over-the-top absurdity of the later Terrifier films, and therefore lacks a lot of their charms. So I'm not really going to dwell on it for very long because, let's be totally honest here, Nobody would remember All Hallows' Eve if Terrifier didn't exist to follow it. After All Hallows' Eve, Damien Leone wanted to make a new feature-length film to really put art through his paces and see if this character that he'd been tinkering with for years had what it took to carry a whole movie in a single unbroken story. However, since art's actor Mike Ginelli stepped away from the role, a new actor had to be cast, and David Howard Thornton ended up taking the role an unheard of actor who got cast as art after his time playing the Joker on the Batman YouTube fan series Nightwing Escalation. Leone took advantage of this changing of the guard by re-evaluating art's best characteristics and tweaking the tone and style of Terrifier to better play to those strengths and the strength of the skilled comic actor who had just taken the reins of art. The first movie in what is now the Terrifier franchise came out in 2016 and it was very, very different to art's prior appearances in Leone's work. Despite being on a very small budget of just $35,000, there was a heavy emphasis on gruesome practical effects for the film's huge amounts of gory violence, and one scene in particular involving a hacksaw and a mostly naked woman chained upside down gained particular notoriety for the vividness of the graphic torture scene. But despite the film's, uh, liberal attitude with fake blood and body parts, Terrifier maintains a glee to it that helps keep it watchable in all but the most painful sections. Extreme cinema with heavy gore or other crude content designed to shock you is nothing new. We've all heard of the human centipede, Salo, or a Serbian film, but Terrifier doesn't take itself quite seriously enough to earn that title, at least in my opinion. It's got a lot more in common with films like 1981's The Evil Dead, which similarly grew criticism and renowned for its violent, gory content, but is a genuinely entertaining genre experience designed not to just exhaust or sicken you, but to be taken as part of a wider thrill ride experience. Whether or not the first film succeeds in creating the thrill ride it's going for is debatable, but that's at least the direction the first Terrifier film was leaning in. Terrifier isn't just a festival of gore and discomfort, but has a lot of genuinely solid tension and some great acting by Thornton, as he uses art's silent nature for some very memorable moments of comedy. I think my favourite one in the first film has got to be when Art yelps in pain, but the scream is totally silent. Cracks me up every time. Unfortunately, the other cast members struggle to pull their weight in the acting department, and the writing in general can be more than a little shaky. But it shouldn't be surprising when you remember the film's budget was so low that Leon wrote, produced, edited, and directed the film all by himself, as well as doing all the makeup and special effects. If you view the film as less of a complete project and more of a prototype, a tech test if you will, to see if Thornton's art is capable of carrying a franchise, the whole thing makes a lot more sense, and the test results are pretty conclusive. If art was to arrive in Dead by Daylight, the chapter should no question be based on Thornton's version of the character over Ginelli's. The original art was fine, and definitely the best bit of the All Hallows Eve anthologies, but it was Thornton's characterful physical comedy that made art into an icon, and adapting Ginelli's more mean-spirited take on art would be a massive missed opportunity. That isn't to say Thornton's art isn't mean-spirited, he really is when it comes time for it, but it balances out with his goofy nature to keep Terrifier, and especially Terrifier 2, a lot more watchable than it otherwise would have been. Of the two movies, Terrifier 2 is far and away the better one, if there's one movie that should really be used as the basis for a DVD chapter, it's Terrifier 2. Because in terms of watchability and genuine glee in its tone, it succeeds in every way the first film tried but failed. Art is great, 
menacing fun to watch on screen in both movies, but Terrifier 2 treats the entire film with the same surrealist, nightmare-like tone of Art himself, and it ties the experience of watching its gargantuan and admittedly excessive 2 hour 24 minute runtime together in a more satisfying way. Terrifier 2 feels in every facet like the best refinement of the art formula to date, with better writing, a higher budget, and a more humorous tone than Terrifier 1, and by extension the Ginelli era, all while maintaining the macabre gore special effects and legendary performance by Thornton that were the only reasons you watched those earlier films in the franchise, to be totally honest here. The supporting cast, while still far from perfect in the acting department, put in way more committed performances than the cold porridge you see in Terrifier 1, with special recommendation for Lauren Levera's charismatic final girl, Sienna, who never becomes a tiring presence on screen despite the massive runtime. Both Thornton and Levera have been confirmed for Terrifier 3 that's currently in production, and I can't wait to see what the two of them have in store for us next time round. I'll talk more about Sienna later, but for now let's talk Dead by Daylight. That's what we're all here for after all, isn't it? It's not like I made this series a way to trick DVD players into watching a video where I talk about a film I like or anything, how messed up would that be? The way I see it, art is the main and only real attraction to a Terrifier chapter, to the point I'd say only a fraction of people who see the face and recognise it have actually seen a Terrifier movie. Kind of similar to Jason Voorhees, the character is better known than the films he stars in. As a result, Art would be an ideal candidate for a solo killer chapter, because regardless of the quality of the movies that he's in, he's always a star of the show, and the main, if not the only reason you watch it. Given that behaviour seems to be on a vogue lately of one character releases, with Year 8 set to feature two solo survivors and one solo killer, it wouldn't surprise me to one day see Art as a solo character for Dead by Daylight. Business wise it would be the safest choice. Terrifier is a smaller IP than most of what DVD tends to go for, so a smaller release would be fitting, allowing art to flourish in the killer roster while freeing up resources for Survivor and map stuff to dedicate to original characters or bigger licenses that might demand that attention. Admittedly, Terrifier might still be too small for Dead by Daylight at all, even with a solo killer chapter. DVD tends to go for big horror names to headline their licensed chapters with the smallest we've ever had being probably Hellraiser, Ringu, or Evil Dead, and Terrifier might be too new, too inaccessible, too indie to make it into the game. The closest we've ever come to an indie project like Terrifier in DVD is the Crypt TV Cosmetic Collection, and that's all it was, a cosmetic line, not a proper chapter at all. Even though the Terrifier films have a frantically devoted cult following and art has become increasingly recognisable over the past year, devoting one of the four killer slots in any given year to him would be a business risk. Although a smaller film project were to be featured in DVD's future licence pool, Terrifier would be a great and natural place to start. In terms of reputation, Terrifier punches well above its weight. But with DVD as a hall of fame for the heavyweights of horror history, I'm not sure if art is widely known enough yet to pass this incredibly high bar. That honesty though, isn't the biggest issue I'm seeing with a potential Terrifier chapter. The greatest concern for me is something a bit more artistic than that. For a horror game, Dead by Daylight has largely kept a squeaky clean outside public image, and it's pretty clear that that's by design. Behaviour wants Dead by Daylight to be the ASIM horror game's answer to Fortnite, McDonald's or Coca-Cola. Mass marketable, easy to process with the widest possible appeal to the lowest common denominator the one-stop shop for any consumers passing by to dig into a game as family friendly as any game with BDSM torture demons really can be. But if DVD wants to be Coca-Cola, Art the Cloud mixes that cola with Everclear Vodka, a line of coke, and a chaser of concentrated battery acid. Terrifier is grimy and edgy and cheap and mean and nasty and vulgar. It's as family friendly as a prisoner of war camp and about as hygienic. I love Terrifier for what it is, and so do many DVD players, but a truly dedicated Terrifier chapter would be a huge tonal leap for behaviour that they might just not be comfortable with. The gore would have to be toned down extensively, something that would be a hard sell to Terrifier fans when the gore of the films is the big reason to watch them in the first place. Seriously, if you haven't seen these movies, you have no idea how carefully I've had to edit this video so the algorithm doesn't eat me alive. And this would be most obvious in his Mori, which would doubtless be a more PG-13 version of one of his kills from the movies. And Behavior might not want to work with a franchise so steeped in grungy, cheap and nasty violence. Although to be fair, 
they did with Saw. This may be supported when you look at the recent DVD player satisfaction survey, put out by behaviour where they list licences that they think are notable enough to mention on the survey to gauge players' interest in those licences. Oh, just for the record, uh, Magic the Gathering appeared in the video game section for licences this year, so uh, yeah, I'm feeling pretty fucking smug about that one. In the films and TV section, there's just a lot of names that we expect to see. Big names with lots of street cred and hype behind them like Alien, Predator and Candyman. There's also loads of them that seem odd. From very small or just dead franchises like Trick or Treat, Buffy or Pan's Labyrinth, to straight up non-horror licenses like John Wick, Jurassic Park and even Charmed. Like, I don't know why Charmed is on this list, sticks out like a sore thumb, and I cannot picture the mind of the person who voted for it over anything else on this list. And yet, there it is. But Terrifier isn't. And that seems odd to me, because there's been community hubbub and demand for a little while now to have art in Dead by Daylight. The fact that Damien Leone and Steve Barton have both gone on record saying they'd love to have art in the game should qualify it for the list by itself. And with the level of attention that that garnered, I highly doubt they've just forgotten art exists when they were making this list, when there are much more niche or dead licenses like Charmed that have made it onto the list. That means that Terrifier, logically, was for some reason intentionally left off the list, and I can see two reasons alone as to why that might be. It is quite likely, I'm sad to say, they thought about it and decided Terrifier in DBD just won't work. Maybe for the reasons I discussed earlier, it's too niche, it's too edgy, it's too much of a risk, or some other reason altogether, but regardless, if they decided that art absolutely isn't coming to Dead by Daylight, that'd be a good reason to keep art off the list, because there'd be just no point. The only other explanation, however, is that it's already coming. No need to gauge how popular a license would be if the chapter is already coming up. You commit to it, it's happening. So save your votes of franchises that they haven't already secured. And while I think the first possibility is more likely of the two, as every chance one of this year's two licensed killers will be Art the Clown. And suffice to say, I'd be very excited to see him coming to the game. But what would Art actually do? What is there in Terrifier to translate into a power? One of Art's most notable traits is his wide variety of implements he uses to torture and kill that he stores in his trusty trash bag. What well, almost any of them could be used as his basic weapon, from a rusty meat cleaver to a hacksaw to a spiked chair leg, my personal favourite, one that he seems to default to as a tool of agony is his whip, which is strung with rusty surgical tools and needles like a cat and nine tails. He uses the needle whip of the climax of both Terrifier films, and I think Art would be incomplete without it. So incorporating it into his power I think would be a natural inclusion, but as one other piece of kit, Art enjoys breaking out from time to time that would certainly make him stand out from the crowd of killers. In all his appearances so far, Art has carried a gun. Although he's pretty hesitant to use it in the Thornton era of the character, he doesn't tend to use it on the people who are truly at his mercy. He has other plans for them. Instead he typically breaks it out when he's about to get beaten either by literally bringing a gun to a knife fight, or memorably by shooting himself in the head when it's caught by police at the end of the first film. Actually, Art dies at the end of both the Terrifier movies, but is resurrected both times by the pale little girl, an entity that seems to present herself to Art in his image and resurrect him whenever he dies, allowing Art to still be reasonably defeatable but lets him keep coming back for more each time. Given that Art's resurrected immortality has been used twice to get him out of being truly defeated, Maybe there's a novel way this could be implemented into Art's power as well. The first time he was resurrected at the coroner's office where he was able to make his escape, and the second time his first survivor Victoria actually gave birth to his severed head while she was institutionalised, allowing him to be free any stinger for Terrifier 2's upcoming sequel. So we've got Art as a tormentor with a painful whip covered in surgical tools and the ability to come back from the dead. I think there's a piece of the puzzle missing that would make a Terrifier 2 inspired chapter really sing. And that's a survivor. Sienna, played by the inimitably excellent Lauren Levera, is Terrifier 2's leading lady and final girl, a high school student and very skilled amateur cosplayer who becomes Art's newest fixation alongside her brother Jonathan and ends up killing the clown at the climax of the film. Her late father is a major part of Terrifier 2's story as, as drawings in his sketchbook suggest he was on some level aware of Art and his actions in the first film, as well as Sienna's eventual fate as Art's killer. He even made her a sword razor sharp and impossible to burn, 
that eventually came to Sienna to help her take Art down in her darkest hour. Sienna is possibly the 21st century's most memorable final girl so far. Being by far the best non-art performance we've seen in Terrifier film to date, and with Lavera confirmed to be returning for Terrifier 3, it seems like Art has finally met his match for this franchise going forwards. There's many questions still unanswered about Sienna's father and his relationship with Art, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what Leon has in mind for Sienna and Art's future. As a result, I think if Art was to get a full chapter with a survivor, it's gotta be Sienna. Like, I'm sorry, but you're not telling me this cosplay fit with the wings and shit would not be fucking badass to see in the game. While I think Art would probably end up a solo character, La Vera Sienna would still be an amazing inclusion to the game, and would be a loving tribute to the film that propelled Art into public consciousness. So with all this in mind, what power would I end up actually giving Art if I had the power to do it myself? Well, let's take a look, shall we? Art the Clown, or the Mime, has a basic weapon, the spiked chair leg, and moves at 115% speed with a 30 meter terror radius. He is a tall killer with a power endless cruelty. Comes in two parts, Needle Whip and What's in the Box. In addition to his weapon, Art wields his Needle Whip that hinders for 15% the first survivor hit in a 10 meter straight line for 3 seconds with the severity of the hinder scaling up from there and reaching a 25% hinder, which is 3 meters per second, so like faster than walking, at a range of 7 to 10 meters, in a range known as the sweet spot. A survivor who's been hit in the sweet spot while healthy will be afflicted with deep wound when injured by art during the 3 second hinder duration. His other power is what's in the box. Six Art Crispy's boxes are scattered across the map. At any time, Art can pull the pistol from his belt and shoot himself in the head. When he does so, the killer can cycle through each of the Art Crispy's boxes, looking around them before choosing one to emerge out of. Art's severed head will roll out from that box, growing the rest of Art's body behind it. A survivor who isn't carrying an item at an Art Crispy's box can spend 12 seconds pulling a sword out of the box. A sword has 4 charges and breaks at 0 charges. Charges are spent by swinging the sword, or being hit with a needle whip, which loses 1 charge, being hit in the sweet spot with the needle whip, which has 2 charges, being put into the dying state, which is all charges, and being basically attacked by R after 3 seconds of being hit with the needle whip, which also drains all charges. Whenever R is stunned by a pallet, he becomes vulnerable for 5 seconds. If a survivor swings a sword into him, using the reassurance key twice during this time, he will be killed and forced into the R Crispy's box cycle to respawn again, forcing him to teleport effectively whether he wants to or not. Killing Art this way removes all charges from the sword. A sword swing is 0.75 seconds that has the same range as the killer's basic attack. And as per usual, there are a bunch of add-ons to play with as well. Let me know what you think. Art is an interesting character with an interesting origin. He's far from the breakout successes you see in the history of most horror icons. Saw, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, Hellraiser. They all started out with the first film that rocked the world and spent the rest of their lifetimes as franchises trying to bottle that lightning and keep themselves relevant, to recapture the magic that made the first film special. Art is not like that. Art took a while to come together, and several attempts by Leon to iterate and endlessly improve the craft of filmmaking to get not just art, but everything else in the Terrifier films that orbits around him, from the script to the cinematography and even the acting, to the best standard it can be. Terrifier 2 is the best step so far, for sure, but there's still a little way to go before Leo makes the best Terrifier film he can. But suffice to say, Art's already made enough of an impact and more than merit his arrival in Dead by Daylight regardless. He's become an icon of the times among horror fans quite naturally, by Leon's sheer persistence and skill as a makeup artist and director, paired with Thornton's irreplaceably compelling performance as the killer clown himself. Truth be told, I don't think Terrifier in Dead by Daylight is very likely not as likely as many of the other franchises I've covered in this series before. But it's far from possible, and by far one of my most wanted. We have two licenses coming up this year, so I'm holding out hope for the newest killer clown on the block to make it into the fog. Okay, so that's everything I have to say about Terrifier and Art the Clown in Dead by Daylight. If you enjoyed this video and wanted to see more like it, there is a playlist on the cards now where you can look at all my other Plenty of Problems videos over the past year or so that I've been doing them. I do one of these every month, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss another one of these or any other video that I put out. I want to give a special thanks to three very important groups of people, starting with Factor75 for sponsoring this video. You can recommend trying out Factor75's wonderful meals for yourself, and if you're interested, use the link in the description and the little code 
on the screen right now to let them know that I sent you. Special sure thanks also to my beautiful patrons over at Patreon who get early access to all my videos and a bunch of other sweet perks. If you are interested in supporting the channel, that would be the place to do it. Never under any pressure to do so, it would just be really sweet if you did. But most importantly, massive thanks to Damien Leone and the rest of Team Terrifier for making these movies with such a big heart. The more I've sunk my teeth into Terrifier for the writing and editing of this video, the more I've started to really love it, and I cannot wait for Terrifier 3. Mr. Leone, if you keep making movies with your heart in your head in this sort of place, don't you worry, we'll keep watching them. On that note, I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.